morning is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. And as I'm reading this, let the Spirit move you as you listen to the Word of God. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when divided with wonder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of God to the people of God. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. I'll be candles doing this. Three out of four times. Well, I don't know how many of you noticed it yesterday, but if you didn't notice it, it's perfectly fine. It was easy to miss. Yesterday was technically the first day of winter. <laughs> it was 83 degrees at our house. John and I got out to see you, and we were not the only ones on the lake. Winter in Florida. Mm. I know some people are here because they want to escape those harsh winters up north, and the rest of us are here just dreaming of a white Christmas. That's okay. It would have been an easy thing to miss. Because uh, winter is not really marked by temperature. Winter is marked by the length of the day. Technically, I guess you would say the length of daylight in the day. And yesterday, being the winter solstice, from the shortest day, it had 10 hours and 18 minutes of daylight. Now, that sounds like a lot. But when you compare June 21st with the summer solstice, that was over 14 hours of daylight. A marked difference between the two. So in terms of daylight, these are the darkest hours of the year. And some would say that given the state of humanity and all that's going on in our world, these are some of the potentially darkest days in our history as well. Times are tough in a lot of ways and a lot of places. All kinds of problems in the world. Problems with health, with health care, retirement. Still problems with unemployment, underemployment. We're under the constant threat of cyber attacks and terrorism. We have weather and climate change stuff to deal with. We have strong vocal differences of opinion when it comes to politics and faith. And even on a personal and interpersonal level, day by day, there are difficulties, there are problems. But on the brighter side, we're not the first ones to go through this stuff by any stretch of the imagination. There are folks in this congregation today who've seen tougher times than even these. They've seen times when the whole world seemed at war. When we go back to our history, our own country's history, to the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, and there were some very precarious times in those days. You can keep going back in history, you find troubled times all over the place. And that's actually where you find Isaiah. 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah prophesied the words that Steve read for you a few moments ago. And most of the 700 years up to Jesus' time were in times of struggle and difficulty. In Isaiah's time, the forecast for the people of Israel was pretty bleak. There was this superpower in Assyria on the border. Their lives their lifestyle, their nation, even their faith was hanging there in the balance. And into that darkness, 
Isaiah spoke these words. In the passage today, <clears throat> Isaiah tells of a promised time when God will send a child who's going to be a great leader, who's going to be the Messiah, who's going to be the one to save his people. He's going to have all authority, it says. He's going to boast the names Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And his authority will grow and he will establish peace and it will become an endless peace. What time between Isaiah and Jesus to develop this great desire and this anticipation for the Messiah come, this deliverer that Isaiah talks about. And at the time of Jesus, the Romans were in charge and they were universally hated by the Jewish people. They were brutal rulers. They were pagans as far as worship went. And they levied these almost insurmountable taxes on the people. And so there's no wonder at that point in time that the people really, really was looking forward to the Messiah's coming. And even though there was this great longing for the Messiah, no one could agree exactly when and how he was going to come. All the different major groups of the time had different views as to what had happened in the past, why it had happened, how the future was going to unfold. And so it's into this kind of time that Jesus is born. This kind of longing and yet turmoil at the same time. In chapter 11 of Isaiah's prophecy, he describes what this peace is going to be like. It does it a little further. He says, the wolf shall lie down with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fat lay together. And a little child shall lead them. It's a great image, isn't it? I see that in paintings and sculptures all the time. Peace. That's not just a lack of conflict, which is what we normally experience as, as peace. But this is a different kind of peace. It's going to be a peace that brings reconciliation. It's a peace that's going to bring renewal or an establishment of relationships that are going to be joining conflicting things in compatible ways. And it sounds pretty good. But it's a little idealistic, don't you think? Yes and no. It is because we never really see that, do we? I don't know about you, but I don't see that a whole lot. I'm assuming that if I put a lion and a lamb together, after a little while, only one of them is coming out. <laughs> but that's not what it says here. It says that there's going to be some peace. And though sometimes I think it's unrealistic, when I really look at it, and I think about what Christ has done for us, what he does in us and what he can do through us, it is a possibility. Let me tell you a true story of how realistic this kind of peace can actually be. It's a story that takes place in 1963, so it's 50 years ago. Don Richardson was a missionary to the Salty people, and they were uh, isolated people, at that time still headhunters and cannibals. And he lived among them for several months and learned their customs and their ways. And he tried to make them have peace with each other because they were very warlike people, very violent people. And he reached the point where he was just kind of giving up. Well, all of a sudden, there was another opportunity. It was that a few months earlier, about seven months earlier, he had established a, a camp in their territory. He built a house and moved into it with his wife and his uh, son. And they lived in this house on the outskirts of the territory. And after a few weeks, two villages located near them, and this big field, open field, separated the two villages. And at first, Richardson thought, they're going to be able to get along. We're here, we're different, we're new, we've got some modern things that they might be interested in, so maybe we can teach them to get along. And his optimism was very short-lived. He said because in the first two months he lived there alone, there were 14 fierce intervillage battles. And then he stopped counting. It just happened over and over and over again. He said, he described it back then as the, the children were trained to get their way by the sheer force of violence and their temper. They were goaded into retribution, any insult, any hurt at all. And they were given those kind of constant examples by their parents. And people who thought of new ways of treachery, they were become legends among the people. So that was their culture, that was their way. But there were 
were a few peaceful times, and Richardson tried to teach them in those peaceful times some of the stories of life. And by and large, they were kind of disinterested in the whole thing. But there was one story that got their attention, and this is how Richardson described it. He said, I was describing Judas's betrayal of Jesus. About halfway through the description, I noticed that they were all listening intently. They heard how Judas had kept close company with Jesus for three years, sharing the same food, traveling the same road. That any associate of Jesus would conceive the idea of betraying such an impressive figure was highly unlikely. At the climax of the story, there were whistles of admiration. And I sat there confused. Then the realization broke through. They thought Judas was the hero. He and his wife had a couple of long discussions about their purpose there. They had, of course, wanted to bring the gospel to the people and thought they could be able to reach them and still not destroy them or their culture, but it seemed hopeless. And so his wife said, but God always finds a way. Let's keep believing for that. And they agreed to do that. And then the very next day, there was a big battle again, the worst yet. And they decided maybe it's best if we just leave. Maybe our coming actually is done just the opposite. It does just deprive them of the isolation you need to survive. So the next day, he gathered the chiefs of the two groups together and said, we're leaving. You all can't be at peace with each other. You keep killing each other. And it's only going to get worse unless we leave. So we're leaving. But then that night, a delegation from each of the villages came to speak with Richardson and they begged him not to go. He said, but I don't want you killing each other. They said, we won't. We're going to make peace tomorrow. So the next morning, Richards and his family got up and they looked out and across the field were these two villages on opposite sides of the field facing each other. He thinks, this is how it always starts. But then there were two men, one from each village, who walked out to the middle of that field. Each one carried a son. And then they met in the middle. The first one said, Will you plead the words of my village among your people? And the second one responded, I will plead the words of your people among my people. And the first man said, Then I'll give you my son, and with him my name. And the second man said, It's enough. I will surely plead for peace between us. Then the second man presented his son. They exchanged sons. They exchanged names. And then shouts came up from all the people of joy for most of them, sadness from a few because it was their child, their family who was given away. But then the ceremony continued and people were invited. If you're willing to accept this child as a peace child, then come forward and lay hands on them. And old and young men and women came forward, one after another, to place hands on them. And then former enemies confronted each other face to face. They exchanged gifts and they exchanged names. And they believed that as long as these children were alive, anyone who placed their hand upon them could work violence against the ones who had given it. It was their peace child. Of course, Richardson was moved by it, but a little puzzled by it. And all his efforts to bring the gospel to these people and to get them to be at peace, this was what was seen to be doing, and it seemed to be very powerful amongst them. So he question amongst himself, well, should I go? Should I stay? Is there a way that I can actually get this gospel across? <clears throat> after a couple of months, after reflection and a lot of questioning about the depth of what this truly means, and seeing it actually work, Richardson gathered the leaders of the villages together. And he said this, when I saw you exchanging children, at first I was horrified. I kept saying to myself, couldn't there be another way for peace without this painful giving of the child. But you kept telling me there is no other way. And then, in accordance with their custom, he leaned forward and slapped his hand on the ground. That means you're right. And he continued. When I stopped to think about it, I realized that you and your ancestors are not the only ones who found that peace requires the peace child. God, the spirit whose message I bear, has declared the same thing. True peace can never come without a peace child. Of course, there was silence. Because God wants men to find peace with him and with each other, he decided to choose a once-for-all peace child to establish peace forever. So the 
nation. He goes, who is this? And he answered the question with a question. He said, when your men came forward with the children, did they bring their own sons or someone else's? And they said, their own, of course. He said, God said the same thing. That's exactly what God has done. And they sat and they thought for them. And then Richardson read from his Bible in their language this prophecy from Isaiah. Unto us a, son, a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And they asked, is this the one you've been talking about? And they said, yeah, he's the one. I said, didn't you say someone betrayed him? Because if he's a peace child and they betrayed him, that's the worst thing we could do. That very day, several of them became followers of Christ. And over the months, a few more. And hundreds more. At Christmas, they had a feast together, and one of them, in their own language, read the same prophecy for to us a child is given. To this day, 50 days later, they're still followers of Jesus. He is the peace child. He's the one who's going to reconcile all people to God. And as Richardson said, we have a peace child. His name is Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the greatest gift of love ever given. And he's the greatest gift of love you'll ever receive. He is the one. And when you know him in your heart and your soul, you know what true peace and true love really is. Jesus makes it possible for us to experience the full love and the forgiveness of God. And with his love living within us, he begins to change us and make us like him. Scripture says that as followers of Jesus, each one of us is made a new creation, a new creature in Christ. But the neat thing is it doesn't end there. As you can see from the message today, it goes beyond that. It's not just a message of peace and love from my heart and soul, but it's supposed to live within me that changes me so they can live through me. We can reach other people. And we can help other people be reconciled as well. That other people might know who God is and what God has done for us. And we can be reconciled to God, but also to each other. And as followers of Jesus, we have to realize our lives aren't our own anymore. It's not about us. We're in the process of being transformed, being in the process of being changed to be like him. And like him, we continue his ministry. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 describes that ministry as a ministry of reconciliation. This is what he says. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Now we know that sometime he's coming back, and when he does that, he'll bring a complete change and restoration to the world to bring a new heaven and new earth. But in the meantime, you and I are his followers. In the meantime, you and I, by his power and his grace, are supposed to be agents of that love for reconciliation. We're supposed to tell people how they can be reconciled with God. We're supposed to help people know how they can be reconciled with each other. <laughs> so here's this question. It's about reconciliation. Question is this. To whom do you need to be reconciled? 
To whom do you need to extend forgiveness? To whom do you need to extend that love of Christ that you've received so that they will know it as well? It may not be an easy thing to do. It may be very difficult, in fact. But as Mary found out, everything is possible with God. That person, those people, whomever they may be, they may not be open. They may not be open to your invitation, your desire. You may not know how to find them. You may not even know they're alive. But don't let that stop. Because the place where it begins is in you. In your own heart, in your own soul. In your own mind. That's where it begins. Today we let this Advent candle of love. It reminds us of the love of God through Christ. So remember the love that he's given in Christ for us. That love that gives us the forgiveness that we need through his life and death and resurrection. The new life, the eternal life that he has for us. And then also remember the love of Christ that's working in you. That's changing you, that's transforming you, that's making you that new creature. That's conforming you so that you can be just like him. And remember the love of Christ that's working through you. So you can give yourself to this ministry of reconciliation. Christmas is for reconciliation as much as it is for anything else. And it's that because Jesus is our peace child. May his grace and peace be with you. With you. Our most gracious Lord, we say thank you for your love, as you've expressed especially through your Son, your great gift to us. Lord, certainly we're not worthy, but we're needy. So help us to remember what you've done for us, how you have forgiven us through him and his life and death, how you've given us new power in life, through his resurrection. How you have given us the promise of eternity through his ascension. But Lord, help us to remember this is a gift that we're not supposed to hold on to and cling to. That Jesus himself didn't do that. But he gave himself. And so Lord, help us to give ourselves. And help us to be part of this wonderful ministry of reconciliation that you've given to us. To help others know how they can be at peace with you but also teach us how we can be at peace with others. How we can know your peace living in us and through us. And Lord, may that bring joy to our souls and glory and honor to you. We ask it for today and for each and every single day. Through your Son. Amen. Let us stand as he closes our worship. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let us sing his praises.